Good afternoon. The Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners regular meeting uh, is today on March the 9th. And uh, we'll start off with introductions of the dais. Leslie Hervey, clerk to the board. Christy Richel, assistant clerk. Stephanie Summerall, Dumas Commissioner. Good afternoon, I'm County Commissioner Denise Treehouse. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Charlie Annis, Prosecutor's Office. And I'm Hamilton County Commission President Alicia Reese. So welcome. Uh, we will start with a uh, silent prayer and um, certainly there are a lot of things for us to pray about. I would just ask to keep uh, Bernadette Watson who's been major community leader, um, former Avondale Community Council President, former Chief of Staff for former Mayor Charlie Lucan, and also is one of our uh, appointees on the CMH board and also was on the revitalization board of Union Terminal Revitalization. Uh, she lost her son, her and Thomas Watson, uh, late last night. Mm. And uh, just please keep the, them in prayer along with others as we pray today. Thank you. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summero Dumas? Yes. Uh, we have a public hearing that was scheduled for 1.15. Uh, we're going to advance that uh, now and go into uh, the public hearing. Okay. For an actual resolution to pass the allocation plan. Okay. Um, so if we can get Patty to come through on the Zoom. There she Hi. is. Hi. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, there it is. Okay. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Santa Cruz, and I'm a field director with the National Development Council. I'm pleased to be here today um, on behalf of um, Planning and Development Department of Hamilton County um, to talk about the Home ARP Allocation Plan and open this public hearing. Um, NDC was engaged by Hamilton County to assist with the development of this plan. So I have a few slides for you, and I'll, I'll get started and then answer any questions you all may have. So the American Rescue Plan Act, also called ARPA, included $5 billion nationwide to be allocated by HUD through the Home Investment Partnerships Program. Hamilton County received $5.4 million. This is a one-time funding opportunity that is separate from the county's annual home program allocation. Um, the funding must primarily benefit qualifying populations and the funding must be spent by 2030. So who are the home ARP qualifying populations? These are persons currently experiencing homelessness, people that are at risk of homelessness, um, people fleeing domestic violence, victims of assault, stalking, and human trafficking, and others requiring assistance to prevent homelessness or who are at a great risk of housing instability. These are the qualifying populations that must be primarily served through the home ARPA funds. The eligible uses of these funds include 
development, acquisition, or construction, or rehab of affordable rental housing, tenant-based rental assistance, supportive services such as homelessness prevention, case management, legal services, education services, and others, non-congregate emergency shelter, and then nonprofit operating and capacity building assistance. Those categories are limited to 5% of the budget each. And then administration and planning has a cap of 15%. So in the development of this plan, um, NDC began working with Hamilton County in December 2022 uh, to work with them to ensure that they meet all of the following requ requirements um, um, as required by HUD. Uh, the, to start this plan, we must, uh, Hamilton County needed to consult with uh, required agencies and service providers. And these are providers and organizations that work with the qualifying populations. So such as the continuum of care um, uh, strategies to end homelessness and public housing authorities and those service providers that are providing services to those qualifying populations. Um, we also needed to complete a needs assessment and a gap analysis for all of the qualifying populations. Um, as part of this plan, as part of the requirements, um, uh, Hamilton County is required to make um, a public notification of the amount of the home ARP allocation and the range of activities that must be undertaken. Um, and that was done uh, beginning on February 18th, uh, beginning on February 18th, um, and provide for a public comment period of at least 15 days um, and hold a public hearing, which we are doing today. Um, and then in the development of the plan, which has already been posted to the Hamilton County's website, uh, we must describe the home ARP activities, the home ARP housing production goals, and identify if any preferences or referral methods were gonna be used for any of the categories. And Hamilton County, as with all other grantees, are required to submit the plan to HUD no later than March 31st, 2023, or they would basically be forfeiting the fund. So a plan is due by that date. So a little bit about the consultation that has taken place. Hamilton County consulted with the following agencies and groups as part of the development of this proposed plan. So the community, um, the um, COC serving the jurisdiction's geographic area. So that is strategies to end homelessness, the homeless and domestic um, violence service providers, veterans groups, public housing agencies, and again, public agencies that address the needs of the qualifying populations and other organizations that address fair housing, civil rights, and the needs of persons with disabilities. As I mentioned, the project um, kicked off in December, 2022. Um, from December through February, we conducted a needs assessment and gaps analysis for the qualifying populations and also continued um, to conduct stakeholder engagement with those providers, um, which I just spoke of. Uh, we made the draft plan available um, by February 18th. Today, we're holding the public hearing on March 9th, and the public comment period will close um, next, actually next Wednesday, March 15th, and then um, commissioners will consider this plan for adoption next Thursday, March 16th. And again, the plan must be submitted to HUD no later than March 31st. And here, um, I will talk a little bit about the survey that we um, opened uh, in January, at the end of January, um, that was um, closed, it's closing as of today. So some of the feedback um, and data, uh, feedback that we received through the stakeholder engagement um, was that funding is needed to provide supportive services for the qualifying populations. We heard from a number um, of service providers serving these populations that there's just um, an additional need for that, which is allowed under the Home Art Plan. Um, we also heard um, that there is a need for the development of new affordable rental housing and operating expenses um, uh, for the nonprofits to serve the qualifying populations. Um, as of March 2nd, we had received 66 survey responses through the Survey Monkey um, that was out and is out through today. Um, and, the, and the priorities through those surveys we heard were the development of new affordable rental housing and preserving, repairing existing affordable rental housing and supportive service funding. 
And the data that we looked at, um, and this is data that we received from the continuum of care. Some of the data we looked at was the point in time count from 2022, um, uh, the number of the housing inventory count for these qualifying populations. We also looked at census data, American Community Census um, data for uh, 2015 to 2019. Um, and as you can imagine, the data shows that there is an insufficient number of shelters bed for the homelessness and um, for homeless and an insufficient number of available affordable rental housing units for all qualifying populations. And I do wanna note that um, all of the shelters or the majority of the shelters that um, serve this jurisdiction are located in Cincinnati and, and not out um, beyond in, in Hamilton County. So people that are um, experiencing homelessness um, usually have to get to the Cincinnati if they're looking for emergency shelter. So after the consultation and um, reviewing the data, um, Hamilton County is proposing to use the home ARC funding as follows. Um, for supportive services, $1 million. Um, for the development of affordable rental housing, housing $3.7 million. Um, $273,000 for nonprofit operating expenses, which is the maximum statutory limit that is allowed um, to be expended for that category. And um, administration and planning um, proposing to fund at $491,000. Um, this is 7% and 15% is allowed. Um, and keeping in mind that the admin and planning that 495 491,000 would be for the, the full administration and these funds must be used by 2030. So it would, be, it would cover more than you know, one to two um, fiscal years. And the activities that are identified here as proposed um, are proposed to be selected, selected through a competitive request for proposals or a request for application process. And that concludes my presentation. Um, at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions and I'll open up for my colleagues. Uh, when you said this, we have until 2030 to spend it. And when I'm looking at these buckets and based on the need of affordable housing, rental housing development, uh, supportive services, um, how realistic is that to go over multi years? Cause it seems like that could be utilized in one fiscal year. That's correct. That um, I think HUD wanted to give folks time to get these funds out um, uh, because of all the other funding streams that are happening right now. But our intent would be to get this fund funding out sooner rather than later, probably in the next couple of years, because of the current need. So uh, we anticipate not taking our time and spreading this out over that seven year period, but maybe in the next three to four years have all that money out. So we make, meet the deadline and also meet the need that's out there right now. Gotcha. And under the support of services of a million dollars, I don't know if this was the grant because I know we're getting a lot of different grants, but when we had the um, uh, coalition to end homelessness um, seemed to be hand tied on what uh, he kept saying that his hands were tied in terms of what he's able to do. And, you know, I always said I had a, an issue that we would be upstairs approving millions of dollars and then go down the, uh, the elevator. And people out there who need help now, I know they, um, I was told that street walkers or people that can help ambassadors would not be allowable. Is this the grant? They said a grant was coming that would allow flexibility. Is this the one? I, I believe that is the case. I think that is what we heard is that there's some gap still in the, particularly the folks that are on the street that could use additional assistance. And uh, so that's why we did want to make sure we carved out that million for those kind of supportive services for the folks we see just outside our, our, our building. Gotcha. Well, I just wanted to make clear um, that that's something, I don't know the minister, I don't know what that process is, but it's just, I mean, it's, mind-blowing that we stand up here and say oh we did this or in homelessness we go down the elevator and they're laying around everywhere saying we need help and and then you know we can't pat ourselves on the back up here and then we get to the streets even in front of our own building we don't see anybody walking around trying to help anybody 
So how, Mr. Ludo, how would this be helpful? Or how can we make sure that that we got somebody, I, I want to see somebody with a T-shirt or something, with an iPad or something walking around and be able to see some of the money that was spent. So I think there's a, a couple of things here. Uh, first is, number one, working, continuing to work with planning and community development uh, on these specific supportive services to make sure that as, as these are put out there, whether it's going to be uh, whether it's going to be competitively or through a sub-recipient agreement, that we target specific um, services for folks that for the types of needs that we know we have for for these folks, I would also say that um, uh, when um, uh, uh, when strategies to end homelessness when was Mr. Finn was in here uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he had uh, also provided some information which I forwarded to the board about some additional work that's going on uh, between strategies, three CDC, and Mental Health Recovery Services Board uh, to provide some additional funding uh, to make sure that the folks who are out there who, who can approach those folks have the tools they need uh, in order to get these people to the type of help they need. And I think what he would, uh, Mr. Finn was saying when he was here was that the funding, to your point, Commissioner, the funding that he was getting right now was very limited to the subject of housing and that he couldn't put people out on the street that had the tools to give those, get those people into the wraparound services they need. But through this grant, through the work they're doing with Mental Health Recovery Services Board, um, we'll be remedying that. So I think we'll we'll stay in touch with community development on these specific services and also follow up on that other work with mental health uh, to make sure we get some support out, out here on, on the court in the Court Street area as well. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure he had mentioned that there was a grant possibility that would help us do this. Um, I just want to be on the record today that I want to see something. Um, I want to see, it's hard for me to see when I go down the elevator. And I, upstairs, I voted for millions, and downstairs, I got lots of people walking around. Uh, I do see people sweeping. I do see people picking up the trash. But I don't see that other piece, and I just wanted to make sure. They had mentioned one of these grants. I didn't know if it was this one. But I do want to put on the table that as we're doing all these things, we've got a lot of grants going on. Um, I'm the type of person, I'm like a secret shopper. I want to see what we're doing. Not saying we're not doing anything, but I want to be able to see, and I can testify to say, no, I saw people doing this, that. I can testify that, that people are sweeping, people are power washing, people are picking up trash, but I cannot testify that I see anybody with all these people. They should be coming to me. I should be able to give them to the people that has the expertise, because I don't have the wraparound services in my pocket myself. Uh, but they're asking me for help, and I want to make sure that what I'm funding is actually helping the people. So I just wanted to put that on the table. I, I don't know if we're at that point, but as we move to the next level, uh, I wanted to have that. I appreciate Mr. Finn uh, letting us know that his funding is restricted and limited and that there may be some other things that provide flexibility. Uh, Vice President Drew House. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. So can you help us understand how these dollars that are being utilized for affordable housing might interface with the dollars that we've set aside and given to CDF for also affordable housing and, and what the expectation is about how these two things fold together? Yes. So um, I believe the, the ARPA money that came to the county and now is at CDF had its own strings and goals attached to it, uh, more for the provision of affordable housing generally. These are this uh, unusual hybrid between what we typically know as home and ESG funding. So these are targeted purely for places with supportive services. So th these buckets where that 3.4 for uh, affordable housing will be for places that have staff on site to help folks in those transitions from homelessness to getting back on their feet. Whereas um, I, I would imagine many of the projects that CDF is going to fund are more income qualified uh, for people that are either seniors or people that have low income jobs, all those kind of things. So this will be complimentary, I would say. Can I, um, just to follow up on that then, so the funding here through the home dollars, is it for construction or is it for supportive services for the agencies that are already, already have that established? Right, so the 3.4 million would be for construction of affordable units, but that have supportive services attached to them. And then the $1 million is for supportive services like uh, what um, uh, 
uh, President Reese had mentioned for more of the wraparound services, uh, things that are currently a gap that we found during our study uh, for this plan. Okay, great. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation and for the young lady who presented. So no questions necessarily about that, but she made, a, I think, a poignant statement as it relates to homelessness and that the rescue homelessness facilities are in, within the city limits, uh, emergency uh, housing is in the city limits, and even I had investigated that domestic violence um, emergency housing is, is all within the, the city limits. So uh, we need to look at that as a board, and do we need to purchase a, a building or have a available a place out? Because we know homeless is not homelessness is not just here in the city limits; it's all over. Um, I will also indicate that Mr. Finn did give me the additional information as relates to um, not only the many partners that are helping homeless. So we're doing great things with homelessness, but it's always much more to do. And he also explained to me where those monies were going. So I want to say publicly, since I said publicly for him to give it to me, that he did provide me uh, what we needed. But uh, if there's one person on the street, that's one too many. Uh, but I thank you so much for this. Uh, information. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, we do have one, um, I think, we do have one speaker on this uh, during this public hearing is Matthew, is it Horjays? Please let, tell me how to say it correctly. I don't want to mispronounce your name. It's, it's, it's Horsch, Madam President. Horsch, okay. Welcome. You have two thank minutes. You. Uh, my name is Matt Horsch, and I'm, uh, I sit on the COC's board for our community, and uh, I also, I, my seat is in representation of individuals who uh, participate in and serve those who uh, work with our rapid rehousing programs uh, for uh, affordable uh, housing uh, for individuals that can provide subsidies of up to two years to help them uh, enter and maintain housing. Um, I'm also here uh, as part of my uh, work at Shelter House. I'm the Director of Continuous Quality Improvement. Um, I work with data. I work with three housing navigators. Um, and we have a great team there. And uh, I'm here today. I wanted to underline some of uh, what makes this home ARP opportunity a little bit different than what we've seen previously. Um, so the COC receives about $26 million to uh, provide uh, subsidies and rents and also supportive services uh, and administrative costs for our various programs that do rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and uh, coordinated entry um, and planning for a community. And one thing that uh, HUD is not allowed uh, for many years with uh, the COC funding is increases in supportive services, not once. Um, we have a program at Shelter House, it's called the uh, homeless Individuals Partnership Program, we received $251,769. To my knowledge, that is the same allocation we received in 2004. And so these services are incredibly valuable, uh, and yet HUD doesn't increase those amounts. Um, I am frontline, uh, gung-ho, really in favor of affordable housing in our community. It's wonderful. Work for ha workforce housing can be a dirty word sometimes. You want to make sure you're targeting the folks with low incomes. Um, but what is super important is that we utilize this opportunity to focus on supportive services funding, perhaps even more than a million. So, thank thank you, you all very much. Thank you for your testimony. Do you want to? No, Madam Chair, I was just wondering, was there anything significant that he needed to add to his statement, even though he only yeah. got two minutes? I thought his information was just so yeah. interesting. Were you done? Well, I'm, I'm happy to keep going because. Oh, no, we don't want to add, we don't want to add. Excuse me. You, can, you, you haven't read my you emails. You can contact our offices. <laughs> you can contact our office. So um, okay. You can contact our office. We should sure. get more information. You have something in writing, maybe you could. I can, I'd be happy to submit something. Uh, one thing uh, was I, I did have difficulty finding the plan on on the website. Okay. Um, so I mean, if if the full plan is there, that'd be that'd be really helpful. But right. it's very helpful to be here and, and to yeah. speak. For thank you. Thank, thank you for being here. Oh, and thank you guys. You guys were really wonderful to the community during the pandemic. 
um, with You've Saved Lives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. See, a point that we have been able to say that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I tell you, she was this gavel. Huh? <laughs> Can't take it. No, no, that was, that was good. I want you to address something, though I thought it was good. In here, uh, it, he just testified. You, come on, no, director. <laughs> Um, he just testified about we went with a million dollars, and this is a seems like that's a big opportunity. It's a big opportunity through HUD for us to do the wrap around, and we've got a lot of funds that we're doing. Not to say you can't get more funds for affordable housing, but we're doing a lot with affordable housing already, forty million and all of that. Um, and then we have some other funds that we usually have from our CDBG dollars for affordable housing. Why didn't we go above a million dollars? Why a million? Was that all we could do, or what was the rationale? No, uh, that that there's no cap on that particular item. So we knew from the feedback that we should not do all just affordable housing with this money, even though it was tempting to do it with all the words that have been out there lately about the need there. Right. Um, so um, we actually, I, I believe, even the city when they were doing their plans, they were looking at doing as much affordable housing as they could, these funds. Um, but it was through the feedback with the community uh, that we understood that that's not the only need here. And so that we created that million dollar carve out without, you know, saying that's gotta be the number, but do that that's significant. Um, so it's this week of opportunity for folks to weigh in on those numbers and let us know what the final plan should look at like. Yeah, gotcha. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I probably would want to look at, since for so long, HUD did not allow the supportive services, and we're doing a lot with uh, production, development, uh, gap financing, for affordable housing, not to say that that's the total needed, but if this is our opportunity for those wraparound services, I want to make sure we're taking the fullest of uh, opportunity. I don't know what that is. But just wanted to, the testimony made me think about that a little bit more. Um, Vice President, yeah, Trudeau, just want to ask about your this. Your microphone needs to be. It is. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to draw this distinction, though, again, and which is why I asked the question. So, the housing that we're talking about, this affordable housing through this grant, has supported services in the housing. Yes. Unlike the, some of the dollars that we put in CDF, which do not require that type of housing. So I just want to make this distinction because I, I think it's important that the federal government has clearly defined a certain population that's to be targeted through these funds. And I, I just, I want to get clarity one more time on that just to make sure I'm clear on what, what kind of housing we're referring to. So this is all housing with supports built in. That's correct. Okay. okay. So the, the 3.7 million includes wraparound services. It will only be used to support projects, actual mortar, uh, bricks and mortar projects that have those included. We already have. Well, that will have them. They have to be included in the package. Like gotcha. when they apply, they have to say, and we will have these services. So it gotcha. won't be just housing units. There will be supportive services at that facility. Okay, good. Thanks for that clarity. Okay, um, Commissioner Dumas, did you have anything to add? Nothing. Okay. Um, where do we go from here before I close it out? Where do we go from here? Yes, ma'am. So uh, there'll be a resolution uh, to approve the allocation plan at your thir next Thursday's meeting at the March 16th meeting. So this is in that window between now and then. That's the opportunity to, if there's any need to change anything, we could make that as we present it uh, in a week. Okay. And where can people find this plan? They were yes. Online. Yeah. It is buried a little bit. It's in our community development section of the planning department. And then I believe it is a PDF sort of uh, down the page. So I'll make sure that uh, Matthew has uh, access to that. Um, and we can uh, get that back out to folks uh, one last time if anyone wants to weigh in. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, end the public hearing. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will go back to we have one public comment. Um, William J. I don't think we got to have your last name. Do we have to have the last name? 
So William J. There's you have a two lot minutes. of identity theft going on in this uh, whole country, you know, worldwide right now. People saying they're somebody they're not, and uh, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, we're all given names. We're all given identities. And, um, a lot of the problems with the government today is they want to take control, and they want to. They think they know more than the people know themselves, and they want to take control of every situation, put everybody in a study, a classification. Nobody, none of you want to be put in a classification of uh, any any classification. You would want to put anybody in. It's, it's a problem a lot of people have. They want to be self sufficient. And yeah, you're talking about all the good things. I mean, you can um, you can have all the access to all the funds you need to do something. But there's we have a major problem with abuse, waste, and uh, yeah, fraud. There's no other word for it. Starting with people that have been approved to lead the country with identifications. To, starting with the last administration of the Trump era, that were tied to hunting and fishing licenses. Where um, people like myself that were uh, I, as a business owner that I sold, um, I'm also in, I'm under the classification of I'm protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's it's, it's a difficult thing to deal with, and I think we can solve the problem. Um, hopefully, where um, people that the problem what they say of what they classify people in these these uh, mental health groups is they they don't believe anybody can get better. They think you're, you're going to be mentally ill the rest of your life, and it's because they don't let people stand up for themselves. We need, they need someone to speak for them, a lot of these people. And a lot of them are victims of attorneys that have conflict of interest, and there's still lots of attorneys that are dealing with these people that have continue to have conflicts of interest in secret that need to be exposed. And they, they think you're doing, they're doing business for you. This isn't just one field we're talking about. It's many. Very famous people are calling for help of nonprofits that are abusing their nonprofit status that need to lose their nonprofit status because they're stealing for the people that they say they represent and they're they're posing as it's going to another country where I guarantee it's arriving. I have a proposal that I want to make, but uh, I, I'll, I'll find the proper way to do that because people love to steal ideals in this country too. Thank thank you for your comments. Um, if you don't mind, um, commissioners, I'd like to. Uh, before we give our comments, I'd like to uh, advance. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, MSD uh, who is here, and uh, this past, I believe, weekend, uh, there was a major incident involving uh, MSD um, Mill Creek wastewater and wanted to give an update. I know some people called. I want to thank MSD for emailing um, through Holly. Uh, updates for us, uh, and I want to thank the administrator for texting us. Um, I, I know I was in church, so when I came out, I got the text that uh, this happened. So I just wanted to allow them, um, Diana Christie, to come forward. I just uh, asked her to join us today, her and her team, to give us an update on what's going on and uh, make sure people understand uh, about the safety of, of water. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, Madam President, commissioners, and the administration. Um, I have here with me today uh, Ryan Welsh and Jenny Richmond, our deputy directors. And um, I'm going to give an overview and, and then just kind of depending on what additional information you, you may want, um, both of them can weigh in. So um, as you just summarized, yes, we had a, a major power failure on Sunday. Um, and. I'm going to get into the background and what happened, but I do just want to say um, we are operational as of last night. We did, uh, we were able to get uh, at least one of our pumps running, so that's the good news, uh, and I'll explain what that means uh, by the end. Um, we're not entirely out of the woods yet, and we're still responding in emergency uh, with emergency activities. Like the microphone's different. So um, let me just summarize quickly uh, what happened. Uh, so again, this was 7.30 a.m. Sunday morning, March 5th, uh, and at MSD's Mill Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant in Lower Price Hill. Uh, we lost all electric, electrical power following a catastrophic failure of a high voltage transformer. Uh, without power to the plant, wastewater in the sewers began overflowing into the Mill Creek and the Ohio River through falls. Very sensitive. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, through constructed relief outfalls. So these are the um, these overflows are referred to as combined sewer overflows. So these are points points in our system um, where the flow can uh, exit the system, and, and where we also have overflows, as you know, during wet weather. 
Um, so MSD immediately, um, with, with people on site, uh, immediately notified the Ohio EPA. Uh, that's through the Ohio EPA spill response hotline, um, who also um, uh, notified Ohio EPA's uh, Division of Surface Water, who's the regulatory portion of Ohio EPA that we work with routinely uh, for our, our plants and our, uh, our permit. Um, we also contacted US EPA's National Response Center, uh, or SANCO, which is the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, and uh, local emergency planning committee and other local response uh, centers to ensure that all potentially affected people would be notified and alerted to the situation. As you mentioned, we also started our own round of calls, uh, just making sure everyone knew uh, of the situation because it really was um, severe and, and not something we had experienced before. Um, the, uh, what, as part of that notice and, and you know, just ongoing, just wanted to continue to let people know that our local drinking water was not affected, um, is not affected um, be, uh, because of the overflows at this site and um, that we're experiencing our downstream of the Ohio River intake for our local water. Um, any other communities that might be affected are the responsibility of those other bodies uh, to notify them. but not aware of any um, nearby communities that have an Ohio River intake uh, within the vicinity, uh, vicinity of the impacted area. Um, but as a safety precaution, uh, one of the things we wanted to get out, uh, especially with some of this nicer weather, really just um, letting people know to avoid recreation in the lower Mill Creek and the portion of the Ohio River just immediately down, uh, downstream of downtown Cincinnati. Um, so the response plan, again, this was you know, all put in action very quickly Sunday. Um, obviously needed to restore power as quickly as possible. We have small generators and we were able to get uh, other small generators at the site quickly on Sunday, but that was only sufficient to power the buildings and our IT servers. Um, in order to power the equipment needed to run our facilities, we needed very large backup generators delivered on site. Uh, th these are not like generators that anyone you know, potentially uses for their home or a camper. These are uh, semi-track mounted um, turbine generators that produce megawatts of power. So in order to get those, um, we had them from out of state shipped here. Uh, they come on semi-trucks and we had seven generators for a total of 10 megawatts of power. That was um, through the day Monday, they arrived on site really overnight Monday, Tuesday morning. And then at that point, we had a team of high voltage uh, electricians that were working to connect those generators to our substation to provide power to the plant. Uh, it took you know, nearly another 24 hours really to make all those connections and then to ensure that um, it was safe to start uh, returning power to the, to the facility. Um, so then we began a process, uh, MSD operations staff carefully placed processes online really had to be methodical about this. Uh, this is a, um, a complex system, and we had to make sure that compatible systems were operational before we could turn on the large pumps. So once we had our equipment and our processes and tanks sitting for a few days um, that you know solids were settling and other things were um, putting pressure on the equipment and, and moving parts. So couldn't just flip a switch and turn things back on. We were doing it very slowly and carefully. Um, this started with uh, our blowers. That was one of the first things to get aeration. Uh, we restored primary thickening tanks. Then we worked to uh, flush, uh, flush our grit to prevent clogging, opening and aligning gates. Um, it, during all this, we were performing SCADA checks. That's our, um, our system where we're able to monitor the entire network uh, through our IT system. Um, we had to get the bar screens running, the conveyor, and then finally, we were able to turn pumps on. We had a pump running last night. Um, and as of last, so that was Wednesday evening, uh, we began pumping and we're taking about 65 to 70 uh, million gallons per day uh, is the, it's the quantity that we're able to treat right now. So that's coming into the plant. It is going through our, our primary treatment and disinfection. Um, so that is very good news. And we've already seen significant decrease uh, in our sewers. So. Um, in our sewer system, uh, we have the interceptors that run up the Mill Creek and service downtown Cincinnati. And we've already seen those levels decrease. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the CSOs um, that we're actively discharging have been drastically reduced as well. Um, 
But as I said, with this, that is not uh, full treatment, that is not full pumping capacity. So we have a few things that we're still doing, a few checks that we're still running to get additional pumps online, probably in the next day. Um, not sure if we'll have another one on today or not, but that's a significant improvement in the situation. Um, uh, I think the other, another thing that has been in our favor, um, you know, last week we did have a significant rain event, and so we had a lot of flow. The Mill Creek was, um, was flowing well, so moving things quickly into the Ohio River. Uh, and then since then, the Ohio River level, which was high, has been dropping, which has allowed that flow to get out and move, move faster. So the Ohio River being high um, was making it a little bit more difficult for the flow to get um, out of the Mill Creek. So let me talk briefly about the, the impact, the environmental or any public health impact, uh, and, and what else we did. So during the outage, um, we took all possible measures to minimize the impacts of the environment, and specifically the Mill Creek. Um, there were no uh, other environmental issues as a result of the transformer incident and the failure. There was no oils released to the environment or other hazardous chemicals. So what we're talking about is the um, impact of untreated wastewater getting into our creek and, and the streams and the river. So uh, what we were able to do, and, and you know, we can monitor our collection system. We could see how far the impact was. We could see where the overflows were occurring. Um, and we did everything we could to offload the flow from the sewers. Um, we were able to utilize storage at one of our um, locations. It's SSO 700, so area where we've done a lot of work. So we're able to offload some of the flow with storage there. Um, that is a facility where we can do treatment in wet weather, so we're able to do that. Um, we also notified all of our customers that haul uh, to the plant. So we notified the haulers, we notified our industrial customers that we typically um, service and service things like grease traps at restaurants. So we didn't do any of that routine work uh, this week. We put that on hold to the extent uh, we could. Some of those haulers, um, we worked with Butler County and Northern Kentucky, Northern Kentucky SD1, were able to take anything that you know, couldn't be held. Um, and so they were you know, fortunately helpful in that situation as well. Um, and then we also worked with the Army Corps. So there is a, um, a lake in Winton Woods uh, where the flow level or the, uh, the levels in that lake are monitored and, and managed by the Army Corps. And we worked with them to release some of that flow into the Mill Creek, uh, which added some additional flow and flushing. I believe that was on Tuesday. So um, the other thing is our, our partners at the Mill Creek Alliance, they, um, have been doing a lot of work. We work with them routinely on the water quality sampling and about, um, and measuring in the Mill Creek. And so they've been out doing sampling, you know, and, and will really be kind of working to help us identify whether there are any long-term or residual impacts of this. It's really too soon to tell, but our expectations are that, you know, that now that we are pumping again, that this will be uh, something that does not have a lasting impact on the water quality in the Mill Creek or the Ohio River. Uh, we do continue to recommend avoiding recreation on the Lower Mill Creek and the Ohio River downstream of Cincinnati until further notice. We're trying to get that information out through our social media and partners um, that you know provide those notices generally when there are other conditions in the rivers. Um, so I, I think I'll pause there. I don't want to take up too much time, but I know you might have specific questions. And again, um, uh, Jenny and Ryan and all of our uh, staff in MSD have been working diligently um, and very closely on some of these issues, so the two of them can help uh, depending on the kind of questions you have. So, thank you. Thank, thank you for the update. Uh, I know you'll have more as it continues to go, but we wanted to make sure the public uh, knew. I, I have some questions now. I'm not an expert on treatment centers, um, but I was just looking at, we have Nick Crosley who comes in all the time telling us as we, as we get prepared for something that might be uh, disastrous if you will um, and uh, he does a very good job of saying we got to stay ready so we don't have to get ready I was wanting to know about the um, the big generator not, like you said it's not like your home generator we understand that but um, do we have a um, as he would call it emergency management plan if that were to go out uh, was that already a pre-plan? And also, are there other ones? I know there might not be as big as this one, but are there some other ones that's, if they go out, because uh, you said you had to order something and get something in, 
um, do we have a plan? Because that was one of my first questions was, wow, we got to order something. You know, it's hard to get things. Um, could you maybe just talk about that part? And if there's some other uh, other ones that might break down and yes. give out? I'm going gonna, um, gonna to ask Ryan Welsh to talk about um, the status of the, 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 so it was one transformer that failed. Um, and we, this substation in particular, um, typically has two transformers feeding our plant uh, and why one of those was offline. So, um, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah. Get that. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. So, yeah, um, the, normally there are two transformers. So if one fails, the other one is there to take its place. Um, this is a, this high voltage substation, which is at Mill Creek treatment plant, has been there in operation continuously since 1959. Um, we're currently, we have a capital project that um, the board has approved to replace the transformers, replace the switch gear. Um, that is underway. We've got new transformers. The the one that, that failed was only installed February 3rd. Um, normally, you switch over to the to the redundant transformer so you have continuous power, but we're in the middle of a project. So what we have is the old transformer that was just disconnected just last week. And we're, to get us off of these generators, we're uh, working to move that about 30 feet and then reconnect it to the high voltage lines. And it weighs about 120 pounds or 120,000 pounds. Um, so these things are massive. It's 138,000 volts coming into it and then 13, 1,200 volts coming out of it and feeding other smaller transformers within the treatment plant. Um, so backup power is really not a, feasible, not a feasible option for Mill Creek. And even these generators that we had to bring in from Philadelphia under the emergency circumstances are providing only 10 megawatts of power, which is about 15,000 horsepower, the diesel engines driving them. And we're using um, like 8,000 gallons of diesel fuel per day right now. That's not enough to run the treatment plant because the transformer itself uh, is designed to handle 38 megawatts of power. So what we have today operates the treatment plant in a very limited manner. Um, so we're really, we're being careful about what we run with the 10 megawatts of generation power that we have right now to uh, stop the sewer overflows and treat as much water as possible and get bring things back online. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I mean you're, I mean very technical, but I just want to make sure you under, I understand. You said that we passed in the budget, and and there was something came in in February third, and that broke down. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a capital project right now. It's a design build project. We're installing new transformers and new switch gear for the Mill Creek plant. Um, mm -hmm. This project has been ongoing for about three years, I think. Um, it's taken us two years to have these transformers to, from the time we ordered them to the time we've received them. Uh, the other one is in California where they're manufactured. It was ready to ship, and we're asking the manufacturer to keep it there until we know why this failed. And we're going to hook up the old transformers that we know are from the 1950s, and uh, they were being replaced for a reason, but that's what we're going to have to hook up until we get this resolved. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, I definitely would be not happy with the manufacturer. And the fact that the 1950s lasted until 2023, and the 2023 one broke down in a month. Uh, that uh, you're right. <coughs> Keep what you got over there. We don't want broke down exactly. equipment coming here. Um, so that's something new that I learned. So that's what I was trying to, a lot of people were asking about that. What, how did this break down? Um, so, okay. Um, so the good news in that, and you're, you're correct, um, President Reese, that the, it is the responsibility of the transformer manufacturer <clears throat> and also our contractor is a company called Patrick Engineering has a, the direct relationship with that supplier. Uh, so they're responsible for replacing the transformer and the cost of the, the backup power uh, that we're have it installed right now. Yeah, so and more than that. Is, so right? hopefully our lawyers are getting ready to prepare something for their lawyers because this is. Yeah, 
Yeah, I see Charlie. It's big time. It's <laughs> I'm sure of that. I'll open it up, uh, uh, Vice President Drew. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, you all look a little sleepy. I think there's a reason for that. Um, I, too, got the notification on Sunday and was gratified that you were on it quickly and did everything that you could do to restore the power and, and get um, things moving down on the Mill Creek. Um, I also am really glad that the Mill Creek Alliance was involved here. I, I, they're great partners in many, many things and have... Um, a real affinity for the Mill Creek and have done a lot of work down there to reclaim that that uh, waterway. And so I'm glad that they are on board helping with the testing because uh, they're a great resource. And I, I know you all know that, but I want to thank them as well for their work. Um, so I, I too wanted to focus in a little bit on the equipment. So I, I, I had heard that the equipment that broke down was the new one. The old one was disconnected because we're doing work to replace that one. Um, so yeah, two things. Kind of, it's kind of a where do we go from here kind of thing. If we've got um, one of these units that broke down and the other one's on order from the same place, I do have that same question. You know, what, Maybe it doesn't make sense to continue along that path. I don't know. I leave that to the professionals to figure out. But it's uh, extremely frustrating that uh, you know, we as a board have allocated money and you guys have done the work um, to update uh, in one of our major treatment facilities and the it breaks down in a month's time. I mean, that's just terrible. Um, so it leads to my second question. I, I heard you talk about um, the limited capacity, given the uh, energy that you've got going in, running the the uh, the powered um, you know pumps right now. So is there untreated sewage still going into the Mill Creek in the Ohio, or is it a matter of um, you treating what you can, and the rest of it is still within the system. So we're treating most of it. There is some still going to the river. Um, I, I think uh, I'm optimistic that by the end of the day, we'll have the second pump running. And that that is our, that'll get us to 130 million gallons per day, which is our dry weather flow permit minimum. Um, and then we're, we're working to bring back a secondary treatment, which is a biological process. Uh, that's why we're running the air feed to make sure the the uh, bacteria can breathe and stay alive, um, but it will it will be a period of time to get the process running. Because um, while there was no air for the for a three day period, uh, a lot of the, the bacteria that we need died off, and it gets um, with no air you have anaerobic bacteria growing. So it's that's a, a biological thing. We're culturing mm -hmm. all this bacteria. That's how the treatment process works. So it'll take some time to get back to, to where it's working um, tip top again. Okay. Yeah. And I've actually been to the treatment plant, so I, I actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's fascinating, but I don't love to talk about it. So we're going to move on. Um, I just have one other question. So um, it, when you talked about, and then, so my, my overriding concern is if there is um, a backed up system, forgive the, yeah, that, I don't like that analogy, um, but, uh, but if there is sewage in the system that's not able to move through because we don't have the capacity to treat it, and we don't want that to go directly into the Mill Creek. You talked about sewer backups, which is something that is terrifying to me to hear related to this conversation. So we're not going to see, I hope, um, any kind of backup through the system because we're unable to do the volume that we're used to, and it would then make its way back up through the system and get into people's houses. As of right now, we have not received any calls saying that a home has been impacted by this. So everything that people discharge from their homes or from industries, residential, commercial, whatever, it has gone into our interceptors and basically flow, fl uh, it flowed to the treatment plant, but it pretty much just stopped there. So it is backing up within our main interceptor, and the interceptor has these permitted locations that it can flow out of and into the creek so that it's not going into people's homes. So that is that is the way it was structured and designed so that it, it has these relief points in the system so that we're not backing up into the homes itself. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Diane, I just wanna thank you for such a, a great summary of a difficult situation. So I was able to follow that and I appreciate um, that. And also the fact that there was no great impact to our residents, as you said earlier, due to your quick response. So I want to thank 
all of you for that. That's all I have. Thank you, uh, Director Christie. Thanks for coming up here uh, today just to let everyone know what's going on and give us a little better uh, understanding. And uh, I know you all have more to do. Uh, you keep saying it's a biological thing, and you talk a lot about biology. Uh, but it is uh, very complicated, and it was helpful for me today to understand about the uh, the generator and the transformer and uh, those kind of things. So thank you. We'll let you get back to yeah. to work uh, so we can hopefully have it resolved as quickly uh, efficiently as possible. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move to um, comments, um, motions, et cetera, from the commission. I'll start with Vice President uh, Jury House. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just have a couple of things. I'm distracted by what we just heard. It's really, yeah. what, what a huge issue um, and what a great response really from MSD. So I'm really grateful for their work. Um, all right, so just a couple of things. We all participated in recognizing Dusty Rhodes is retiring. Um, we did a proclamation for him, and um, he's been with us, for been with the county way before all of us, really, um, for 32 years. And so uh, thank Dusty for his service to the county. And welcome Bridget Kelly, our new auditor, who I believe starts on Monday. Uh, very excited that she's coming on board. Uh, and I understand that a lot of the staff is sticking around to make sure things run smoothly. So just wanted to recognize Dusty for his many, many years of service and welcome Bridget Kelly. Um, I also delivered a proclamation this morning on behalf of the commission. It, it is um, Women's History Month, but it's also Social Workers Month. And so I was up at the University of Cincinnati in the School of Social Work, and um, they were very excited to be proclaiming the month for social workers as well as for women's history. And so they, they talked a little bit about the work that they do in many, many disciplines, whether it is uh, with the homeless population or people who are incarcerated or people suffering from mental illness or um, addiction or just many, many things. And I got to meet a couple of the students, so it was really nice, and this commission proclaimed the month, so I'm grateful grateful that uh, we were all able to sign off on that and I could deliver that proclamation. And then lastly, um, Women's History Month. We had a, a nice um, event the other day on the courthouse steps. Uh, I, I read off a couple of fun facts related to the county. Uh, we have more women in executive offices here at the county, so countywide office, than we ever have in our history, um, uh, the majority actually. We've got 50% of our judges are women, and then we have over 100 elected women throughout the county uh, at all levels of government, whether it's with the village council or the city council or the mayors or the township trustees, and many of them were able to come down from Delhi and Lincoln Heights, and um, we had people from Wyoming uh, coming from all over the county to participate in a photo opportunity to commemorate um, this time in our history where we've got more women serving in elected office than ever. So I thank the two of you for participating in that and helping read the proclamation. Um, so I thought it was a great celebration. We intend to do it every year and want to thank the Commission on Women and Girls for having the idea for this recognition and uh, thank them again for their work and thank Mary Mounty and Bridget Darty for helping put it together. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Duke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few things. Um, also attended, as was said earlier, Dusty Rose. He's been um, just a, a great moral support for me as I came through uh, the ranks as uh, in different areas in uh, politics. I also want to mention that I went to the USA Regional Chamber annual dinner since we last met. Uh, participated in the CSO Classical Roots kickoff breakfast, which was excellent. And then we had our legislative uh, uh, delegation meeting just Monday and all the legislators came down and it was very interesting where we gave them our priorities and what we'd like for them to to be fighting for in Columbus uh, so it was a great meeting um, my chief of staff Bishop Hilton attended the, the zoo tour uh, the zoo levy as you know is coming up and uh, they wanted him and our office to see what areas are in disrepair and why they need uh, a levy for this time. Um, I also uh, attended the Women's History photo shoot, and I thank Commissioner Driehaus for pulling that together again this year. It was awesome. Um, I attended the annual meeting of READY up at the monastery in Mount Adams. It's just 
absolutely historical building and um, just had a great uh, presentation up there by Reddy and I enjoyed it. Um, attended the USPS Railroad Station commemorative stamp dedication ceremony this morning. And so we have uh, commemorative stamps of uh, Union Ter Terminal are ready to go if you want to purchase some of those. Um, Madam President gave a very outstanding speech if I had to grade it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. But I thought it was just excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but lastly, I want uh, each office to be uh, ready for a resolution, a uh, supplemental resolution that my office will be put, putting forward for uh, the small events grant, which the board agreed uh, for $250,000 um, for in the community, any uh, events that are going on. But the maximum uh, would be $25,000 per uh, application, which would mean we could only help uh, 10 communities. And I am asking for a supplemental adjustment uh, to increase that to $500,000 so we can help more community events. I know for our large grant um, allocations, um, this small grant is not even half of what will be possibly given for the large grant uh, opportunity. So I'm hoping by no later than Tuesday, you will get an idea of what we're asking for to adjust our uh, budgetary uh, amount that we had already approved. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I um, also um, attended Dusty Rose's uh, retirement and uh, was happy to be there uh, with the proclamation as well, joining uh, Vice President Driehaus, and uh, also uh, welcoming Bridget Kelly, our new auditor, will be starting on Monday, and excited uh, about that, and got a chance to uh, see firsthand Dusty's, uh, his um, photo with the Beatles, um, and that was my first introduction to uh, Dusty Rose. Uh, he and my father were in music uh, promotions, and uh, he helped uh, help promote with Dusty, uh, getting people to buy the tickets to the Beatles. They weren't the Beatles like we know now. So um, it's just uh, great to uh, have been there today for him and his retirement and all the work he's done for many, many years. I um, want to also commend uh, Vice uh, President Driehaus and Mary Maui and the Women and Girls Commission uh, for putting together the uh, photo of the women that are elected uh, throughout this county. And I think each can be a role model to a uh, little girl now can watch and never have to say, I don't see anyone that looks like me. Uh, and girl dads can be out there telling their little girls that, hey, you can be anything that you want to be if you put your mind to it. And so uh, I thought that was just uh, phenomenal. I think we're one of the counties that have the most, uh, if not the most. We have the most. See, we're number one in everything. That's that's our goal, to be number one. Uh, the most women uh, in elected positions, and they're in a variety of positions. So I thought that was just fantastic. So thank you very much for organizing that. And then um, today has been a little, a little crazy. Uh, I've been moving really fast today. I spoke today and gave a presentation to the Cincinnati uh, Regional Chamber for their government day on all the work that we're doing here at the county and our message and direction of one Hamilton County. So I was uh, excited to be able to present uh, today to them and all the wonderful work we're doing and will continue to do in the direction that we're headed. I also had a chance to speak uh, today, and I was with Commissioner Dumas, got a chance to speak and unveil at the United States Post Office uh, newest commemorative forever stamp collection, the railroad stations. And they've got a number of railroad stations, uh, and I'm just gonna go out on the limb, ours looks the best. I love it, <laughs> it our beautiful, structure that we have of Union Terminal is just phenomenal. And so I was happy to uh, join uh, the Honorable Daniel, um, I think it's Tanger Leaney, uh, who is the governor of U.S. Postal Services, as well as Elizabeth Pierce, who's the CEO of uh, Union Terminal. And they were very thankful to the uh, taxpayers of Hamilton County uh, who went and voted to uh, restore Union Terminal. And um, they are celebrating 90 years. So they're celebrating 90 years. It was just a great thing. And what I love also the most was that there were so many 
young people, kids, who were in the building and be able to connect the stamp with the history. And uh, we're in a society where people need to see it. So they see this stamp and then they start asking about it. And then of course, once they start asking about it, we got them. Now we can give them uh, the education about uh, where they're, the building that they were in today. So that I just was happy to see all those young people, uh, children there today as a part of it. I uh, wanted to also say the 513 relief bus is, is moving. And it was in Colerain on Tuesday, and they're in Walnut Hills right now as we speak, uh, providing health services as well as economic uh, services. Um, also on Friday, I got a chance to uh, be very proud of my father, uh, Dr. Stephen Reese Sr. He received the uh, Addy, he was at the Addy Awards, and he received the silver medal, the highest medal for uh, someone who's in the advertising business. And um, he got the, uh, the uh, Lifetime Achievement Silver Award uh, for the work that uh, he and his company have done. And it was just great to be around a lot of creatives, all the people that create uh, the marketing, the advertising. I remember uh, I was there with someone, uh, Judge Yates was there, and he says, who are these folks? I said, they're the people that... It, encourage you on what to buy because they determine all the advertising. Uh, so he has been um, in the advertising business for 48 years and uh, has done some major campaigns for Procter & Gamble, Ohio Tourism, CG&E, which is, I guess, now Duke, uh, and so many things. And I just started as a little kid in the ads, and I, I still never got the check. I don't know what's going on. But I was a little kid in the ads, and my mother started the business with him. And they've done a lot of things uh, with the bank, Star Bank, uh, that resulted in $7.8 million and people getting loans and those kind of things. So it uh, was great uh, to be there to celebrate uh, him and Judy Thompson, who uh, nominated him on the Cincinnati Ad Club. I uh, want to also acknowledge her and thank her. Uh, last but not least, uh, tomorrow will be the last day uh, here in the county for Quentin Monroe, my chief of staff. And uh, I could go on and on, but one of the things that I wanted to say is that when I started uh, in elected office almost 30 years ago now, and I've been in and out and then back in and then out, so it's not straight 30 years. But one of the things I always wanted to do when I said that I was going to stay in Cincinnati when I came back from college, a lot of my friends never came back to Cincinnati. I said, this is not a place where people that look like us can progress, even if we got the qualifications. It'll never matter. And many of my friends did not come back. Most of them did it, that left. I came back on a mission to prove a point that this is my hometown we can do it, we will do it, but we got to do it with hard work. So ever since I was on city council, uh, while I had a lot of issues I wanted to get done, one of my major issues was to start an unofficial training program for people who have the talent that look like me who may leave and never come back here, but to say there's a place for you here. So I started on that journey 30 years ago I'm very proud that I've given a lot of young people, particularly African-American males and also females, but males who never would get a shot, couldn't get the job even if they got the resume, couldn't get the promotion even though they got the resume. And so Quentin Monroe is one of those folks that came out of Central State University, and I have been with him uh, along his life in a lot of capacities, uh, and then finally an opportunity for him to be my chief of staff at 30 years of age. Uh, I think he was the youngest at the time. I know he's the youngest African-American male, but he carried himself with dignity. Uh, he had the skill sets, uh, but just needed the opportunity. And now he will be using that opportunity to move on to Procter & Gamble. And that's what I'm about. Uh, I've had those who've come with me uh, my, my days in over 30 years, they've gone on to be head people at Nike, Nike Corporate, University of Cincinnati, and leading programs, housing opportunities made equal, being the deputy director, 
Uh, they've gone one that's gone from my office to Silicon Valley as one of the chief uh, legal counsels. So that's what my journey is really about. Of course, we want to get issues passed and those kind of things. But I would say my legacy is what I started with when my friends said they would not come back here. I wanted to prove. And I'm very proud of the young people that have come through my unofficial training program where I've had a chance to give them the opportunity to be in positions, make a living, and prove uh, their, their sales and get trained to be able to go to the next level. So uh, after this, we'll have some more cake. I didn't know Dusty's was having cake, but we'd have some more cake. Uh, but please stop by um, and speak with uh, Quentin. Um, and uh, I know that this is, we always in each other's life, so you won't be going too far. I just won't have to pay you now to get some work out of you. <laughs> but I want to thank him, and I want to thank uh, Veda Stevens, uh, who has joined us, and he's 22 years old. So that is one of my missions. I don't talk a lot about it, uh, but I'm very proud of it, and it's a passion and a mission and a purpose in my life, and that's what I will continue to do. So I want to open up if anybody has something very nice to talk about. Quentin Monroe. I got nothing nice. <laughs> I got, I'm just kidding. Vice President uh, Drias. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Quentin I, has been a delight. It's it's just been a real pleasure uh, to work with you, to work on difficult issues, um, to but partner with you um, to try to get to common understandings on many many things. You have been professional. You have you're smart. Uh, you've been very pleasant to work with, um, and, and I think we're going to really miss you here at the county. I know you you're going on to great things at Procter and Gamble, um, so I congratulate you on that. But really, um, thank you, thank you for your service to the county. We're going to miss you here on the sixth floor. Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. You guys said a lot of what I had to say, but I have a few other things to say. Um, we'll miss you, of course. Quentin, you are marvelous. You are responsible. You are professional. You're so intelligent, articulate, so pleasant creative, intuitive, compassionate, authentic. You are a go-getter, great sense of humor, and the second best chief of staff I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I'd like to be number one. <laughs> uh, I also want to acknowledge congratulations to Quentin and his wife, Maisha. Uh, they are expecting. So just, he just got all these good things. Our careers went opposite. I started at Procter & Gamble. He ended up here. He now going to Procter & Gamble. So thank you. And you all can say great things. Take pictures uh, after we get out of here. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Aludo. It's, 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 it's okay. I just, just very quickly, just pointing on behalf of the entire administration, all the department heads, just want to wish you the best of luck. You've been an absolute uh, pleasure to work with. It's been our privilege to work with you over this time. I know you're going to do fantastic things over at P&G. So uh, congratulations, best of luck, and please do not hesitate uh, to reach out on anything. In other words, Jeff will be reaching out to you on some other project. <laughs> that was code. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Ludo, it is your, your time, so you have anything to offer us? Thank you, Madam President. Just one by leave today. Uh, in front of you is by leave number one. Uh, this is a resolution authorizing the administrator to enter into an agreement between the Board of County Commissioners and the Free Store Food Bank. This is the emergency uh, financial assistance uh, to the Free Store Food Bank that was presented that the board had discussed um, several meetings back. Uh, this is in light of the ending of the f emergency uh, SNAP benefits by the federal government, um, which happened uh, or which uh, was initiated uh, or starting in, in March. Uh, this is $2 million, um, and the Free Store Food Bank, as the, as the board is aware, was specifically selected uh, for this specific assistance due to their unique relationship with food pantries, senior assistance uh, facilities, uh, group homes, daycare facilities, those types of things. So they'll be able to use this funding and leverage this funding uh, to get assistance out in Hamilton County uh, to all these other organizations. Um, I saw the director of the Free Store Food Bank at an event recently, and he um, uh, had thanked me uh, 
for this assistance and uh, ask that I pass that thanks along to the Board of County Commissioners uh, as, as he was uh, very uh, diligent in indicating the assistance that this will uh, allow them to provide the residents of Hamilton County given the, the discontinuation of those federal benefits. So uh, with that, Commissioners, I offer it for your approval. Thank you, and I do want to thank Kirk at the Free Store Food Bank. They are so workable uh, and so responsive. If we, I remember we had one a meeting, and we talked about someone didn't have food, and before we could get out the meeting with the gavel hit, food already had been delivered. I mean, they do not mess around there, and I want to thank them. Uh, and they've been out with the 513 relief bus. I mean, just, I tell you, that's the kind of people I really love working with. They try to figure it out and make it happen. So I want to thank them for that. I do have one question, um, just to, not for this particular maybe amount of money, but I did get a uh, request from uh, the community council president of Evanston, um, and he was concerned. They have a pantry, food pantry, and they've got people with needs, but he said the cost of food is going up. So just would like to ask, I think I said something to you, if uh, you or Holly or someone can reach out because these are community food pantries and they take the pressure off of food, free store food bank because they're able to you know, handle Evanston or certain areas. So uh, just wanted to uh, make sure that that was out there as well. Yeah, we will absolutely follow up with them. We'll also follow up with uh, the free store as well, given their uh, uh, partnership with local food pantries, community centers, that type of thing, just to make sure that we're, we're getting that assistance from this level to those uh, individual entities. Okay, awesome. Um, any questions? Madam Chair, I just wanted to yes. repeat what you had said about the pantry in Evanston, that if we can look at other pantries that are also in need, that would be great. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe find out who the uh, free store partners with and who mm -hmm. they don't partner with more specifically. Great. Yeah, glad we're doing this though today. This is important. Awesome. Okay, I'll make a motion to uh, adopt by lead number one. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, sorry, Commissioner Dumas. I just wanted to say something before Jeff got started, if it was okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Just on a personal note, and um, as you were talking about Union Terminal, and just a testament, really, of how far we've come. I could not uh, forget about my mom worked at Union Terminal in the fifties. Um, she worked in the food area, and they would bring. Um, the black workers would bring the food up for everybody uh, at the top floors, but um, the black workers were not allowed to eat on the top level. They all had to eat in the basement. So I thought it was just a testament because now you have her daughter that was sitting on the front row as they were dedicating the union terminal staff. So it just meant a lot to me. So Absolutely. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah, Mr. I, Little, I, anything I, else? Okay, so we'll move to the uh, calendar. We got our engineer. Where's Mr. Beck at? He's just, he's just out of here on us. He did not. He uh, he has the day off. Everyone's what? Time, he gets That's not allowed. Off. I got to put a motion. Where's the gavel? Where's the gavel? <laughs> he didn't. No, he we're didn't glad to him. have you. Yes. Thank you. You have item one and two, right? Yes, Madam President. Thank you, Todd Long, Chief De Chief Deputy Engineer. Uh, item one is a joint agreement with uh, Claremont County, the City of Loveland in Hamilton County for the maintenance improvements of the Loveland Road Bridge. Um, it's project 502015. Total estimated construction costs are $905,000. Uh, we have a, a sh cost share on this particular project through OPWC grant that was applied for by the city of Loveland for $277,598. Uh, Hamilton County Engineers funds out of the permissive auto will be $335,335. Uh, Loveland City will be contributing $67,067, and Claremont County will also be participating at $225,000 even. Uh, so this is a nice opportunity to have a collaborative effort between mm -hmm. three different entities to solve a problem that we have on a bridge that needs some repair for joints, um, the approaches, some railing work, some sidewalk work, some small superstructure work. So that's a good example of partnerships. That's one. What's two? Item number two is a joint agreement with Colerain Township for the construction of improvements to East Miami River Road. It's approximately halfway between Day and Dunlap, moving north through about 700 feet toward the end of Dunlap. It's primarily uh, largely for um, roadway uh, stabilization project, uh, where there's some small landslides that we have to correct before we can 
uh, make major improvements to the road surfacing project. So that's a total total uh, package of $2.9 million. Uh, this is a, uh, also has some cost share with the OPWC grant from Coleraine Township and a 50-50 cost share between the OPWC grant and the remaining funds from the uh, county engineer's office through Permissive Auto Fund. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions, Vice President Driehaus? Yeah, I have a question. So um, the... East Miami River Road project in particular, and I know I've asked this question before, but, and I, and I just, just did text Eric back too about this, uh, just to make sure he, it's on his radar. So when we do, I know, right? <laughs> um, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know he wasn't going to be here, True. but come to find out he's not. So, uh, but you know, when we do these kinds of projects, um, I would hope, and I would, you know, as, as policymakers, um, as one of a, the three, I, I want to think about bike trails or bike lanes when we're doing this kind of work because this one, um, it especially hit me because I'm familiar with East Miami River Road and it is in a very scenic part of Coleraine Township. And uh, I heard from a constituent about how wouldn't it be great if we could start bike lanes um, as we do these kinds of road projects and, you know, connect, 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 as we go, not suggesting that we build all of it at once, but this is a good example of a chunk of road that could start the progress when it comes to just a little bit of space um, in the right of way to accommodate bike lanes. And so I just, I've mentioned this to the um, engineer in the past. These are permissive auto fee dollars that this board passed a number of years ago. And so as we continue to do this work, I'm hoping that we are looking for opportunities when we can to expand that road just a little bit, make it just a little bit wider, so that in 10, 20 years, people aren't scratching their heads saying, man, I wish they had put a bike lane in when they had the opportunity to do that, right? And this seems like a really great opportunity to do that. So I don't know um, what the uh, cost increase would be on a project like this one. It's a pretty expensive project to begin with, um, but I would sure like that kind of breakdown um, and just know that, that we've got an eye towards that as we are repairing roads throughout the county. That's a, that's a great point, Commissioner. One of the things that uh, I think the challenge with uh, road widening infrastructure is the, the, the potential for the uh, right-of-way width, the acquisition. I'm not going to pretend I know directly off the top of my head whether we have a significant right-of-way width on East Miami River Road as it largely follows the river and meanders. I suspect that we probably have a somewhat narrow right-of-way width in that particular location. But that would be one of the things that we would have to look at in order to uh, be able to advance something like that. Understood. And we would, we would definitely need some partnerships with the commission uh, to be able to responsibly spend the road and bridge funds, which we are uh, in charge of, of course, with, your, with the commissioner's help um, to, to look at that. So I think there's opportunities for partnerships across the board. Um, this particular stretch is approximately a half a mile. And I know we've done some resurfacing on East Miami River Road in the, in the past several years, so it would be a, a good opportunity as we start to construct these. So it's absolutely something we will be looking at. I appreciate the comments. Yeah, and I, I don't know what the cost cost differential is, and obviously all three of us need to know that information. But when we first passed that auto tech, that was maybe in 17? I think it was 2019, if I remember it was, correctly. Yeah, it was when, when I was, I wasn't here that long when that happened. And, you know, and that was a challenge, I'll be honest. I mean, uh, you know, to to have to do that, but at that at that time we mentioned this and said, you know, when there's an opportunity, um, you know, maybe we can look at uh, the bike lanes. So anyway, I just wanted to raise it again uh, and and remind uh, that that if there's an opportunity, we pursue that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner Dumas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I did not have any comments until the bike lane issue came up because I know in our recent budget we gave lots of money for bike lanes and I'm just I guess what I'm doing is asking Jeff if maybe on our website we can indicate how much money we've given for bike lanes for those that are really interested in making that uh, accessible and make that happen I think it was like 500,000 so that was for bike paths this is these lanes are adjacent to the road the the money that was flowing to the TID was more for those bike paths along the Mill Creek and up Mm -hmm. uh, through the county, and so they're off road. Mm -hmm. So this one's a little different. These are on road. Okay. How just much did we get for that, Jeff? Do you remember? 
it's 500. I, I think it was, we had, we had 350,000 initially. Yeah. I think we may have put another 500,000 uh, in, in the budget. Yeah. So as, uh, as Mr. Long indicated, if we're looking at, at something along the road, we'll have to just talk about eligible use of funds, um, with the road and bridge fund with the permissive auto tax and what that delta might be and how we might creatively go about partnering to help install those. And I just want to clarify, I'm speaking for myself. I'm only speaking for myself, not everybody else. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead, what'd you say? Well, I said I'm speaking for myself. When we talk, we've talked about this for about four years, uh, and so I just want a breakdown of, you know, what what the cost would be, what additional cost if there is a possibility. I, I speak for myself. I don't mean to speak for the whole commission, uh, but this is something that, that we've discussed before. Okay. Commissioner Dumas. Yes, I, I, just, I appreciate the clarity, uh, Commissioner Drehouse. Um, but just in general, uh, so the public can see what we're committing to bikes and bike paths or bike trails, I think that would be good for people Absolutely. to know. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. You didn't, you didn't hit that very Thank well. you. Uh, now I'd like to make a motion. Are we good? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to uh, pass items number one and two. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Drehouse? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, now we get into uh, Commission Administration. We've got a number of grants uh, that are coming forward, and I'd like to ask Holly to walk us through items number three through 11. Great. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, President Reese. So items three through nine are grant agreements through the county's American Rescue Plan funding. Um, items three and four are the remaining two American Rescue Plan agreements with nonprofits to provide teen suicide prevention services. And if I could pause for just one second, Sarah, I think there may be people out there that are for the particular topic, so if you don't mind, thank you. Um, the first is an agreement with one in five in the amount of $188,000. Through these grant funds, one in five will increase the number of schools that they, they serve through their building resiliency in youth, in youth prevention programs. And they, they project to have an 18% increase in the number of schools that they service through these programs. Um, again, that's in the amount of 188,000. The item number four, again, is a teen suicide prevention grant with Best Point in the amount of $112,075. Best Point will use these funds to expand their current services to include a pediatric mental health urgent care clinic, which would be used as an alternative to and to reduce the demand on local emergency departments. It's anticipated this program will treat um, approximately 300 patients uh, within a year. Uh, we have been, uh, it's our understanding that a pediatric urgent uh, care will help fill a gap in the continuum of crisis services for youth and families within Hamilton County. So for those two, because those are both our final two agreements for our ARPA Youth Suicide Prevention Grants, we do, I believe, have a representative here from one in five, I believe, is, is here. Yes. And we also have a representative from Best Point, if there are any specific questions for either of those two uh, programs. Well, I don't have a question, but I know they've been here a while. Would you like to say a word? Uh, at least for your parking for your parking fee, because you say, want to say a word. <laughs> My name is Jess Hartley. I'm from One in Five, and uh, we're really grateful for this opportunity for this funding, and it's going to go a long way for us to continue to expand the work that we're doing in um, in schools to prevent suicide among teenagers, especially, um, and just start the conversation around mental health and wellness. Uh, we all know we all have a brain, and we've all got to take care of them. And that's really the message that we're trying to communicate um, to students across the greater Cincinnati area, um, just so that they can understand how to better take care of them themselves and their mental health, and um, hopefully in the end, um, end suicide for our community. So that's our goal. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions for one and five? Thank you. Yeah, no questions. No questions. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Gingrich. I'm with Best Point. Uh, Best Point is the result of a merger between the Children's Home and St. Aloysius Orphanage. Uh, we merged last February. And we're um, excited to receive the funding for the teen suicide prevention to support our pediatric mental health urgent care um, and also integrate technology um, to help us better screen and identify youth to detect suicidal um, ideation. Um, so we uh, twofold. Uh, the pediatric mental health urgent care is really intended to cover the gap 
between those kids who have a, an emergent situation but don't need to go to the emergency department. We know Cincinnati Children's has one of the largest inpatient units in the country and is overflowing. The emergency department is overflowing with children with psychiatric conditions. Um, so we want to offer families, children and families, an alternative that they can come and actually get treatment, not just triaged, um, and get connected to aftercare. So really trying to have a better experience for kids and families um, and prevent unnecessary um, emergency department and hospitalization. And then also integrating the Clarity app, which will help us um, screen and detect suicidal ideation. Uh, we know that um, providers are not always successful in detecting when kids um, are presenting with suicidal risk. So using the latest science and technology will help us better identify those kids that we need to pay extra attention to, extra um, screening, parent notification, those kinds of things. Um, so I'd like wow. to thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, any questions? No questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, so these is item three and four. I'd like to make a motion to approve items three and four. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Andrew House? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And so items five through nine on the agenda are grant agreements for our workforce development training program through the American Rescue Plan. So just as a refresher, the board authorized up to five point seven million in our American Rescue Plan Act for um, organizations to expand existing workforce development training programs focused on in-demand careers of construction, IT, transportation, healthcare, and hospitality. We have these um, several in front of you today. There will be several more coming forth in, the, in future meetings. Um, so I'll just go through these one by one because I do believe we also have representatives from each of these organizations here today. So item five is an agreement with Easter Seals Tri-State in the amount of $225,000. They will expand their youth construction pathway program to serve up to 225 youth um, with all graduates receiving up to 12 months of follow-up services. So I think Debbie Smith is here, Vice President of Easter Seals, if there are questions for her. Welcome. We are actually now Easter Seals Redwood as we combined with Redwood. That's okay, when we applied, we probably weren't official. Um, so, but we're very happy to continue to offer our construction training for youth throughout Hamilton County. Um, they will get certification in NCCER, which is core carpentry, Bobcat, forklift, and OSHA 10. So if you have any questions. I do have a question. Yes. What's the placement rate? On these are programs that already exist or is this a new Yes, program? this is a program that already exists. So we currently have a contract with the Department of Labor that we've held since about 2009 for youth build. Mm -hmm. um, we've been very successful with our youth build program and our youth apprenticeship readiness grant, which is also for youth in construction, again, focusing on, we focus 17 to 24, and our placement rate is 75%. Our retention rate is running right around 62% right now at a year, which is still pretty good, even though things have been a challenge through the pandemic. Um, we're able to modify our training so that it's not all in person that we can do some things virtually in combination but we've got to have people on site because you can't make houses virtually yeah no, i appreciate that and then um holly what makes this different than urban league program that we just heard last week or is the same there, there's more there, people we they're similar do? i think urban league is fo um is focused on more adults than maybe youth from what i th recall was being presented last time by urban league gotcha we do work in partnership with each other um, and providing some of the training because there's such a high need and so many industries and specifications that we're looking at. I know they've got their HVAC mm -hmm. as well, which is a part of construction. Well, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. My no questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Item six is an agreement with Cincy Smiles in the amount of 140. 184,500 who will, Cincy Smiles will expand their existing dental assistance workforce training program to include um, training for medical billing, uh, patient advocate, and dental lab um, techniques. So their goal is to provide services for up to 200 low income residents. And of course, like many of these programs, participants will always re also receive links to supportive services and case management. Um, I think the CEO, Sonia, is here. Maybe not. Okay. She wasn't able to make it. Wow, I was looking forward to Cincy Smile. Yeah, sorry. She was here. She oh, okay. Go. Yeah, she was here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll move on to item seven, which is an agreement. Oh, 
with ICRON in the amount of 205,000, they're gonna add capacity to their existing services um, to get through their backlog of people that are on the waiting list for workforce training programs. Um, they are going to work closely with employers to match um, candidates with jobs, and they do offer certifications in building maintenance, as well as restaurant and kitchen settings. Um, again, it's for 205,000, and Randy Strunk, I think is here, the director of ICRON, if there's any questions. Thank you, uh, appreciate the support for this program, and we do have a lot of individuals that are on a waiting list. Uh, for us, it uh, takes a lot of courage to ask for help and then to be told you're gonna have to wait a little while discourages people from following through at times. So we're happy to get these resources to be able to expand the program and uh, place people in more livable wage jobs. Awesome. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and the next one is item eight, an agreement with Cincinnati Health Network in the amount of 225,000. This program, they'll be able to expand their existing training program to, uh, to allow additional individuals to participate, which is focused on medical and dental assistance training. And with this expansion, they'll be able to do more focused classroom training for a shorter period of time, followed by hands-on training within the Cincinnati Health Network clinics. Um, and I believe Brian Vanderhorst, the CEO, is here. If there are, again, any specific questions. Hello. Hi. I want to thank everyone. This is so great for us to be here. And get this opportunity. Um, Cincinnati Health Network is a community health center. We provide health care for the homeless. So our focus is greater Cincinnati, Hamilton County, and the counties surrounding us. Um, with COVID, we recognize that staffing was such a challenge for us and many others. And it was part of our strategic plan to create workforce development. And this opportunity came along and we seized upon it and we were fortunate. But uh, so our goal is we'll be able to train medical assistants and dental assistants in our offices. We'll have a, a specific training program. We hope to do it in a shorter period of time. And then they'll be able to do in-house training within our clinic locations. And we're, we're targeting individuals that are either homeless now, are underemployed, unemployed, living in low census tract areas. So that's there'll be no charge for this as opposed to going to Gateway or Cincinnati State. So we're pretty excited. This will be a great opportunity. Well, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, thank thank you very guys. much. And the last grant agreement um, for your consideration is item nine, which is an agreement with the Community Action Agency in the amount of 225,000. I will say this was the, I believe, the only application we received for CDL training, which I, I think we all have heard about the need for um, CDL licensed drivers. So this program will expand CAA's commercial drivers um, licensed training program. It's a five to six week program. It's in partnership with Napier Trucking, which is an established CDL program in Hamilton County. Um, they expect to serve 41 participants by paying their tuition. 80% they anticipate will receive their CDL certification. Um, and all, all participants will receive job readiness, job placement, and of course, like I've mentioned, with all of these grantees, supportive services and wraparound services. Um, in addition, CAA has some money in the budget to actually pay for people's transportation to get to the training as well to overcome that barrier. So with that, um, I, I believe Eric Thomas, Vice President of CAA, is here if there's any questions or comments for him. Yes, and thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to expand our program. Uh, CDL has been our top performing program at CAA for some years now. And since COVID, the interest and the demand for CDL uh, training has increased uh, easily for us by about 25%. So. Uh, the additional funding to just expand and have more capacity to serve has been a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, no questions as it relates to CAA, but since it's our last grant, I just had a comment I'd like to make. Okay, can I say something? Sure. CAA. Uh -huh. um, I want to just say the Community Action Agency, I mean, I don't know, Mr. Thomas, uh, but when it started under Gwen Robinson, the CEO, I remember she said, we need to start this program and I was at the state, I was president of Black Caucus, and uh, Community Action Agency started this program. We were able to get funding from ODOT, Ohio Department of Transportation, which is not easy to do. And uh, we started the first pilot at Community Action Agency. 
in Cincinnati, and then it moved around the state. And they also, other community action agencies because of the work we did here. But at that time, there was a 90% placement. They had, uh, I remember a single mother who was going back, learning, and then went on and made, you know, big time salary, was able to mm -hmm. get a job where they don't have to be driving out of town. I'm just saying, if that track record has continued, I'm excited to be uh, supporting this uh, because it's something that has been over the years. Uh, we were a trailblazer here in Hamilton County with this program, and it's very expensive to get the CDL license. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of jobs available. So people being able to go and don't have to put up all this money to get the training is a huge thing for a huge gap that we've got uh, as it relates to uh, CDL, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the point where the 503 Relief Bus, I said, it cannot be built where you have to have a CDL. Uh, each of us could drive the bus if we needed to, but I don't know about our driving skills. But the point is, uh, this is needed, and I'm happy to support all of these programs, but I wanted to highlight this this particular one. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have before us, that's the last one, right? Or do you yes, I have one more item, but yes. What's your other item? It's an amendment to the American Rescue Plan, item number 10. Can we do it item number 10 and then open it up? If you yes. Have uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. So item number 10 is an amendment to our American Rescue Plan um, funding plan, excuse me, to allocate additional money to our Youth Resiliency Grant Program. The board allocated one and a half million for Youth Resiliency Grant Programs to provide funding to organizations that help youth um, overcome social isolation that we all know was so exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, grant funds are intended to leverage um, existing programs such as um, outdoor activities, extracurriculars, after school, summer programs, mentorship, those types of programs. Well, I think we uh, um, completely underestimated what the demand would be for this type of a grant. Um, we Again, we allocated 1.5. We received um, roughly 4.8 million in requests for grant funding. And upon evaluation, we the administration is comfortable recommending grants up to 3.9 million. Um, but because those that amount exceeds the 1.5 the board allocated for this, we would need a resolution amending the ARPA plan to move more money into the Youth Resiliency Grant to uh, bring forward grant agreements for board consideration. We do recommend moving money from the Workforce Development Grant line item. The board allocated 5.7 for that but we, are, we did not come near that in terms of applications. Um, so we uh, recommend moving 2.4 from workforce development into the Youth Resiliency Grant. Um, and if approved, we will start then bringing forward agreements for those Youth Resiliency Grants. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I would not have a problem with that, but what I want to say about the youth, and all these grants, let me just go back. I wanna say on all these grants, we give the dollars to these organizations, very good at organ, very good organizations. But what I don't want, and this is my marketing hat, is that there needs to be some clarity on there that these dollars are made available by the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners. You can't just say Hamilton County because a lot of folks running with the Hamilton County brand that doesn't fall under the Hamilton County Board. And because if we don't want anyone coming to us saying, you have done nothing for the youth. What are y'all gonna do for the youth? And where I'm at with all organizations is that when we put these dollars, we must have an ROI, not just the, you know, the PowerPoint. We got to see it, we got to touch it. I want people knowing that this board is taking bold steps because we had to make, all three of us had to make a decision and we have made a decision to put money in teen suicide prevention. I wanna know about some prevention. Uh, we put money in um, uh, other things like youth. I mean, I want to have a whole thing about you. Everybody say, I'm doing this for the youth. And then I walk outside, they nothing to do, nowhere to go, parents getting mad, saying we're not doing anything. So uh, I want, one, that it is known that we're a part of it. Uh, and then second, I want these organizations, this doesn't fall on you, Holly, I'm saying this to the organizations, uh, no more get the money and you run off you are going to have to show us that you actually help youth. And I'm not saying, you know, because when you say youth, here come everybody. 
I got a program and I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm helping two youth. We need to really see it so that we're making some kind of impact. It's just like affordable housing. We got 40,000 units or, you know, missing. We want to see. Now we have 40,000. Now we're only down to 20,000. We want to have those type of uh, results. Uh, and I just wanted to say that to all the people because there had been a trend maybe in the past. They get the money, they come up here, and then they gone. We don't see them no more. And then we get hit with, you haven't done anything. So I uh, just want to make sure that the marketing and advertising is clear and that the ROI is clear because we want to know, too, you know, what we're doing, did it make a difference? So just wanted to share that. That's not on you. I'm saying that to the people that's once they signed the contract. And when they sign the contract, if I may, they, they do have quarterly reporting to report on the outcomes of the funds, and we do have uh, information in there on giving the, the board credit. Gotcha. And we'll yeah. make sure to underscore that as they are giving the final contract. Well, not credit. It's just or like with everybody else. The, we're a sponsor. PPR. We're a sponsor. We're not looking for credit. We're a sponsor of this, and we, we're trusting them instead of us doing it directly. We're trusting them to be an arm of us right. to help get the help that the people need. So uh, that's what we want to make. And some people, they're real good with these reports. Oh, man, they send a typing in and everything and just a typing. And then you go out here and somebody said, I ain't never heard of them. So we want to make sure of that. So thank you so much, Holly, for staying on top of them. Um, Commissioner Driehaus and then Commissioner Dooms, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a couple questions. So, um, and I just a reminder that these are one-time funds because they're the American Rescue Plan funds from the federal government. So um, we've got a lot of ongoing streams, but this is one-time money, and I'm glad we've got the opportunity to disperse it in this way. So I'm happy to support the... Um, the money of going from one bucket, the workforce, over to the youth resiliency. My one question, though, related to that is that we had the Building Futures presentation the other day, and I want to make sure that there is money still available to fund some other projects that have brought to, been brought to our attention. Yes, that, that movement, um, we still will have roughly 1.2 available in the workforce grant budget for other uses once the board, and that does include, we have factored in the Urban League because we, we are under contract. We're going through the contracting phase with them right now. Okay, great. So they're for. Thank you. Commissioner Dumas? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple comments, and you, bring up, you brought up a good point about how programs are going on, and you really don't know that it's Hamilton County. I was reading last night. I'll see if I can find it, um, but it says Job and Family Services. It's the event that they're having. They're not having it, but Job and Family Service will be there. And if you're interested in going to a ballet or a football game or a concert, now to me, in my head, that's beyond your imagination, the program that we have going on through JFS, and that needs to be um, advertised that way. So you brought up a great point. Um, I just wanted to say in general, items three through 10, um, these are such great programs. I've worked personally uh, with a lot of them, some of them as a social worker, but I just wanted to say they're such great programs and we're changing lives uh, with these programs. And I am so touched, humbled, honored to be able today to say yes, uh, to provide these services for these people. So it's, I just needed to say that, Madam Chair. No, okay. this is this is <laughs> want to thank it's the awesome. administration uh, for moving the vision of the board to reality. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, "Oh, it's a one-time thing." People sometimes they got a no time. They were getting no time, and at least one time, maybe we could save somebody. Mm -hmm. Somebody's life might get saved from this. Uh, we're hoping uh, to prevent suicide. We're not worried about Absolutely. what's going to happen in twenty-four. We talking about people right now, and. Uh, the things that we're doing can impact people's mm -hmm. lives so big right now. They're just people out there suffering. They need a right now program and a right now help. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so proud of my colleagues and this board, uh, the way we've just stepped up and this administration uh, made it come to life. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to make a motion. Uh, I think it's historical. I done got emotional <laughs> or emotion, but I like to make a motion. Items three through ten uh, to be approved. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Samaro Dumas? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Holly, for your work.
Mr. Ludo, item number 11. Thank you, Madam President. Item number 11 on your regular agenda is a resolution authorizing uh, the administration to enter into a new cooperative agreement or amended and restated agreement with the Port of Greater Cincinnati and the Convention Facilities Authority. Just a little bit of explanation uh, on this. We are uh, approaching the, uh, the date to refinance uh, or pay off the notes related to the hotel acquisition and demolition that was issued uh, through the Port Authority, total principal of around 53.5 million. Uh, we're obviously recommending at this point that, that we refinance that debt as opposed to paying off all, all of that at one time. Uh, these would be two-year notes uh, through May of 2025. Uh, what the resolution does is really just extends the existing cooperative agreement that we have between the port and the CFA for another two years to allow for uh, the, uh, the CFA funding to uh, be used to pay for uh, those uh, those debt service make to make those debt service payments. Uh, so again, the alternative being uh, to pay off the debt right now, which um, would obviously be financially challenging given the total principal of, of over 50 million. So uh, the administration recommends approval of this. Uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do have a couple questions. Uh, can you identify why do we need to refinance? How long did you finance originally for the for this uh, millennium? I wasn't here, so yeah. How, how what was the the thought in terms of paying this off? So I think the initial thought was at the time we were looking at um, a hotel and convention district project that would move forward back in this was in the 2019 2020 era, looking at a hotel or a convention district project that would move forward. The thought was to issue, while that planning was going on, to issue notes uh, to for three years. I believe we issued them for three years uh, in 2020, which would become due in 2023, with the expectation that at that, at that time we would refinance them into the broader package of whatever that convent, broader hotel and or convention district project would have been. Um, obviously, at that point, COVID happened, and so everything shut down and the, all the plans got pushed out at that point. So we are now back into the business of, of planning in the convention district again. So the thought is to push it, uh, is to do these for an additional two years with a, I believe a six month call on these so that if um, during that time, there is a broader financing to occur as we heard about on Tuesday, perhaps uh, refinancing a lot of things uh, through the convention district that we would be capable of doing it at that time. But that's why we had done it for three years um, or back in 2020 was to give ourselves the ability to do, to put that into a broader refinancing and a broader convention uh, package sometime between then and now. Unfortunately, COVID got in the way of that. Yeah. And so what we're passing today will be another temporary thing because you're saying it would have to be refinanced again. Yeah, it, ultimately, it will be put into the broader common financing package where we will uh, put that in with all of the refundings that we do for the Duke Energy Center and all those other debt streams as well. Gotcha. And what is the note? What is How it? much do you pay? How, we pass this. Are we paying something monthly? So there is a semi-annual interest payment on this. Uh, I believe that is, uh, uh, John, you have the exact number, 1.7 uh, 2, 2. million annually, I believe. I'm sorry? 1.38 Is it semi-annual, so 2.7 uh, annually. We hope... Uh, to make as few of those payments as possible before we wrap that into a broader refinancing. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because someone said, what is bonding? It's like going to get a loan, and uh, we've got an interest rate on it, and we've got to pay a note. And these notes are paid to whom? The Port Authority? It has their name on it. So the Port Authority is is the, the one that is actually doing the, or is actually getting the loan, if you will. Yeah, so no. there, so if you think about it in those terms, Commissioner, someone who's taking out a mortgage on their house, the Port is actually the one doing that on our behalf. And this agreement between the county, the CFA, and the Port essentially says, if you do this, we will use these funds to pay the debt service or the mortgage payment. Um, on it, that you are that, that you have undertaken for our behalf, on our behalf. Okay, and then it says uh, in here the whereas maybe is explanatory, but I just want to make sure I understand it. it. Says whereas the county desires to enter into the 2023 cooperative agreement with the CFA and the port. Is that 
when you say cooperative agreement, is that the refinancing of the? So the again, the, so the port will be the actual entity that is doing the refinancing. The cooperative agreement is the agreement that exists between the county and the CFA, and then the port to say that the money that comes into the CFA will be used to support those debt service payments. So it gives the Port Authority the ability to say, okay, we're gonna go out and, and, and um, sell these notes um, and take on that financing um, burden on behalf of the county and the CFA. This is the agreement that they won't be left hanging and that the money will go to pay those debt service payments. Gotcha. And this uh, cooperative is only between the county, the CFA, the Port. The reason I'm asking that is uh, we were asking at, about the uh, and these is coming out of residual funds. Um, we were asking about, when we were talking about the different financing options, uh, we were talking about the, uh, you know, putting a lot of money being put into this fund during, say, a music festival that has 90% African Americans that attend. And then when it goes in this fund, nothing goes back to the black community. So we were talking about the Black Music Walk of Fame, and I appreciate you were talking about that, but you were saying, you would have to get the city, the county, and the CFA. Where on here, this deal says it's the county, the CFA, and the port. So I'm confused about yeah, that. Yeah, there is, there is a broader cooperative agreement that includes the city, the county, and the CFA. This particular cooperative agreement is only between the county, the city, or the county, the CFA, and the port because it involves the county stream of occupancy tax revenues. Right. And what I was referring to is the county stream of occupancy tax. So is that a possibility? Because you made, you made me think if we went with the cooperative, we had to have the city on board. I'm just confused. I'm just trying to understand the process. This sure. particular agreement is just the county's stream. Right. When we take this out next year, it'll be a broader cooperative agreement that includes the city. Oh, gotcha. So okay. Right now, this is just the county pledge. The broader one will include a city pledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions, uh, Vice no President questions. Driehaus? No questions. No questions? All right. All right. I make a motion to approve item number 11. Second. Commissioner Dre. I'm sorry. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summero Dumas? Yes. All right. We're going to the consent agenda. That's items. 12 through 22. So, uh, Mr. Luda, you want to walk us through? I will. Um, Madam President, so item number 12 is a budget adjustment. This includes uh, additional uh, right of way costs for the Fields Ertel Road improvements as well as uh, the transfer of funding uh, within a, a grant account. There's $3 million that we're transferring within our ERAP 2. Um, with our ERAP 2 fund to fund uh, uh, personnel costs associated with the administration uh, of, that, uh, of, that, of that program. Uh, item number 13 is the resolution for uh, the award of a bid, ITB 081-22, to DeBrock Kempel doing business as MCOR related to the uh, controls, um, the HVAC controls uh, at the Hamilton County Courthouse. Um, item number 14, is the purchase of one Ford F-250 uh, for the county auditor's office. Uh, item number 15 is actually the rejection of a bid, um, of bid 024-23. Uh, this relates to elevators in this building, the Todd Portune Center. I do want to clarify one thing. This relates to the two elevators, one through four. Uh, the, the other elevators, the high-rise elevators, one through 10, as well, the, as well as the freight elevators, has already been awarded. Uh, so just so the, the board is aware that this bid rejection, uh, which was because the uh, the bids came in over uh, by more than by greater than 10 percent, only relates to those one through four elevators. Uh, there's also item number 16 is a resolution appointing a new member to the Hamilton County Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee. Uh, this is Robert Moore on behalf of the Women's Business Enterprise Council, Ohio River Valley chapter. Uh, job and Family Services, item number 17, $500,000 for a, uh, residential group home services uh, with Mayo Home for Youth Development. And finally, items eight through 18 through 22 are those official bond and oath of office 
um, items that came before the board last week, we did clarify uh, that in this respect, the board is only accepting these for the record, not approving, uh, not actually approving the, the members on this, but just accepting for the record. So with that, Commissioner, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just have one comment on item number 15, these elevators. <laughs> I've heard that uh, the bids came in too high. Uh, was on the elevator today. I know you said, um, up to the fourth floor, I need to know what's going on from the fifth to the sixth and on up because well, I'm sorry, let, me, let me clarify that so, one already fixed. So, yeah, so let me clarify. So you stuck in it. So you've got two banks of elevators when you in the in the lobby for those uh, watching at home who aren't familiar. There's one bank of elevators that only goes uh, floors one through four. Yeah. There's another bank of elevators that goes one through ten. These bids, the rejection only relates to those elevators that go one through four. The ones that go one through ten we've actually already awarded. So those, that is underway. When will they get on the way? Because we got stuck today, so coming from Dusty Rose's retirement. That that particular project will, uh, believe, starts this summer. So oh boy. this year, we'll be working on that. Oh boy. It's a lot of steps. A lot of steps, especially when you had a surgery on your knee. Woo. Okay, I, would, I don't know how we can advance it. How do you do it on the calendar? We like to advance the work on item number 15. Okay, uh, open it up. Any, any uh, comments, questions? Well, I was going to speak to what you were saying about the elevator. Maybe I don't know if we need to let people know what seems to be the problem. You got caught. Today, we were going to Dusty Roads. We pressed three. It bypassed three completely and went to four. Um, and so it's like, I don't know exactly what, how can it bypass a whole floor when you press three? Huh? Oh, it went to two, it bypassed three and went to two. Yeah, so yeah I know we, we've had consistent complaints on the elevators. We've had our, our contractor in uh, routinely to be on site. And I think at the end of the day, the, the answer here is to replace the elevator. Or um, either have something to snack on when you get in. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put a vending machine there. Okay. Um, just, uh, Madam President, I have yes. one other um, item 17, uh, Mayo Home for Youth Development uh, the, is a provider. I'd like to know where they are located because we always want to try to keep our babies close to home if we can. I believe, Commissioner, they are on Wolper Avenue in Cincinnati, but I will defer to yeah. our colleagues at JFS if there's anyone online who um, can confirm that. I know they at least have an office there. I'm not sure if that's their headquarters or not, though. Okay, if I don't have, if she's not online, I can find out. <clears throat> this is Laura. I'm online. Okay. Um, and, and yes, they're actually a local provider and only provide services in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a minority owned business as well. So I thought I'd share that. Okay, thank you so much. That's all You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. I make a motion to uh, adopt items 12 through 17 and to accept for the record items 18 through 22. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Dree House? Yes. Commissioner Samaro Dumas? Yes. Any other items? Anyone else? I have one thing I'd yes, like to say, Commissioner oh, Dumas. Madam President. Just in general, whoever's watching, to make sure you get on our website, hamilton-co.org, because we have lots of jobs that are open. Uh, we have resources on there if you're in need for food or housing, and also some uh, really creative programs that are on there. So just take a, a moment and look at our website. That's all. Thank you, and I just uh, remind everyone, uh, once again, Quentin, we're proud of you. And everyone meet us in there and get more cake right after this, okay? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes.